Hello, my name is Matthew Ricks and I'm a consultant upper limb surgeon at Wrightington Hospital and I'm presenting today on the treatment of mallet finger. And this is to the combined ISS H meeting and BSSH meeting. So thank you for the invite. So I'm going to cover certain aspects of mallet finger and maybe focus down on the treatment, both conservative and surgical for mallet finger. So what is mallet finger? So it is a, it's a finger deformity. It's caused by the disruption of the terminal extensor tendon on the distal phalanx. It can be either bony or tenderness. It's described as a mallet because it looks like a mallet. The aim of all treatment is to restore the DIPJ joint extension and to prevent swan neck deformity as an intact extensor mechanism is vital in maintaining the function of the finger and in turn the hand. There are risk factors to developing a mallet finger and this is commonly with a certain sports and activities, particularly ones that involve balls where you can have a direct blow to the finger that causes the force flexion. It's more common in the middle finger followed by the ring and little finger. It's also more common in the dominant hand uh, than the non-dominant hand and more so in young to middle-aged males. The mechanism is twofold. One is a traumatic impaction blow to the distal phalanx causing a forced flexion and therefore injury to that terminal extensor mechanism as it serves on the distal phalanx. The other mechanism is through a laceration or a crushing type injury to that distal phalanx and to that extensor mechanism attaching onto it. These patients present with a swollen, painful finger, usually commonly following trauma and commonly with a DIPJ held in a flex position, and they're unable to fully extend that DIPJ. I advocate imaging for all mallet fingers, and what you're looking at on the lateral radiograph is to see where there's a bony avulsion, to see if there's any subluxation of the joint. Some situations where it's purely a ligamentous injury, you can have a normal bony anatomy, but the finger itself is held in a flex position. The Doyle's classification is what we commonly use for this. And there's a great paper by Doyle back in 1993, classifying this, breaking it up into four main types with a subdivision of four into A, B, and C. Now, the key factor of this classification is there are different types of mallet finger and your treatment should vary upon the different types of mallet finger. <clears throat> the commonest type is type one by far and it classifies acute and chronic by the four week mark. So the ones less than four weeks are acute and ones greater than four weeks are chronic. Type one is a closed injury where you get a dorsal avulsion. Type 2 is an open injury and you get a laceration through the skin down to the tendon causing the mallet deformity. Type 3 is where it's an open injury but it's more extensive soft tissue loss and in some situations tendon loss as well. Type 4 is broken up into A, B and C with A being a paediatric physeal injury, B being 20 to 50% of the articular surface and C being greater than 50% of the articular surface. There's evidence from over the years which have advocated not to operate on any of these. That you don't need to. And this is one paper back in 84 saying that we didn't need to operate. There's a good outcome with conservative measures alone. There's been literature over the years that have looked at the, at the percentage or the degree of articular joint surface involvement from the fracture. And they say that greater than a third is an indication that you should operate on for these patients. Those with subluxation, you should consider operating on. So this is another area that some of the literature looked at, advocating surgery in your mallet fingers. But I think what this does, which is key, is it highlights that they are different than mallet finger injuries. You need to appreciate certain factors to it, and I'll go through the classification with you again in a second. So when it, there's also been Cochrane reviews looking at it, looking at the treatment of mallet finger, and their conclusion from looking at four randomized controlled trials, a big population of patients with mallet fingers, is, whether, is that there wasn't enough evidence to show which was the best way to treat this. There was no pooling of data and insufficient evidence from the comparison tested. So there's no clear advice on it. But what are we trying to do from our treatment? We're trying to prevent the complications, which is an extensor lag and a swan neck deformity. So coming back to our door classification, our type one injury. So I managed these with splinting. It's a closed tendon injury. I spin them for a in full extension for a six week period of time, then I wean them out of the splint. In some situations need to do night splinting and these for both my acute and chronic type one injuries. There are complications and non-surgical management 
of uh, mallet fingers, cold intolerance, skin issues. But I think the main factor in my young patient population group of manual workers is ability to tolerate a finger splint. A fellow of mine asked whether we should mobilize the PIPJ as well, which I th think was actually a good question to ask. And I think, and I pointed him towards a fantastic paper by Katzman et al in the Journal of Hand Surgery back in 99. It was a fantastic study that looked at transected terminal extensor tendons. It looked at PIPJ motion and it did not cause tendon gapping to that transected terminal extensor tendons. Neither did intrinsic tendon tension. That didn't cause gapping either. And that in theory, the PIPJ flexion should actually advance the extensor mechanism. So that's why we don't involve the PIPJ and also prevent stiffness. Type 2 and 3 injuries, by their inherent classification, are open wounds. So they need washout. And in some clean situations, you can consider suture repair or anchor repair back down. But you need to close a wound and consider splinting as well afterwards. I do these under Wallant, so wide awake, low kind anesthetic, no tourniquet. And I wash the finger clean and then repair depending upon the degree of contamination. Type 4A injuries or epiphyseal injuries, they occur in pediatric patients. If undisplaced or reducible splinting, if displaced large bone fragment or subluxation, then I do a transepiphyseal longitudinal K wire through the growth plate and DIPJ with a single pass. And if there's an associated nail bed injury as well, then I repair that. Type 4 B and C injuries, majority of these I manage with extension splinting for a six week period of time, then mobilizing afterwards, and then considering night splinting if, uh, if needed. But if there's a third of the joint surface, if there's subluxation, then I indicate surgery for these patients. I consider fixation of the fragment with K wires or extension block wiring. This is a great technique. I use two K wires, dorsal wire first at 45 degrees, making sure you go by cortical in case the breaks, it can be easily removed. Fix the tendon and then I do a longitudinal wire, getting that distal phalanx fixed first and then reducing it. And once it's reduced, driving that wire into the middle phalanx of the P2 and holding it reduced. So this complication of the surgery is this complication with any surgery, nail deformity, secondary displacement, infection is a big one as well. But sometimes you can still get a residual extensor lag even following surgery, even though you're thinking that you've done a fantastic reduction fixation, but they end up having a small lag. And there's a fantastic paper by Schweitzer back in 2004, which highlighted the position of the DIPJ. Uh, it's sensitive to length of the tendon. So even lengthening by one millimeter, even 0.5 millimeters can cause an extensor lag on there as well. So hopefully that's addressed some areas of mallet finger for you. And thank you for the invite to coming to discuss. Mm -hmm.